give me concept art uh, of what this character was going to look like. Because when I first came on to God of War 1, there wasn't anything I could see other than concept art and, uh, and a script to read. So I went home with a couple of pictures of Kratos, basically sat on the couch staring at a picture of Kratos with scary horror music playing in the background very low and uh, went to sleep. And then I woke up in the morning with the idea for, the, uh, for calling up my Greek foul and uh, getting the words. And I think I had sufficiently churned up the nastiness in the back of my subconscious as to uh, how I could write brutal and oppressive Greek revenge music. Well, as big as I would try to make things sound with the kitchen sink, it was always, could it be bigger, could it be louder, could it be more? So percussion is one way to definitely go there. It's really a kitchen sink of percussion that goes into the God of War music. There's uh, with like two or three different kinds of anvils stacked on top of each other, two or three different bass drums, ground casses, uh, little metals, big metals, um, timpani, uh, and of course, ethnic type loops, doombecks, uh, um, hand percussion of that nature, some djembes, uh, bongos, you know, we've tried everything, but especially for the big giant stuff, when it, you know, you hear that, that first chord, smash! It's like every single possible bass drum sample that I had, <laughs> just and anvils and crash cymbals and everything, just stacked like this. And uh, yeah, so it's, it's actually really kind of a whole new chore just to get down and, and do the percussion parts once you've actually written a piece for God of War, then to go back and do the percussion takes you another couple hours. But, um, but yeah, that's the thing, bigger, louder, faster, as much as possible. Every single thing you've got. <laughs> when I first got out of high school, I was looking to be a rock and roll star. And, uh, you know, it really was tough to do. Uh, it wasn't really working out for me. And uh, at the time, in the late 80s, you really just couldn't even get a job with long hair, and I had quite the hair. Uh, you may not believe it now, but it was there. Uh, <laughs> so anyway, I had this temporary job polishing the, the brass fittings and rails at the Bob Carr Auditorium, which was the local symphony hall in Orlando where I lived at the time. And I was earning, you know, like four bucks an hour or something, and I had all these keyboards to buy, and, the, you know, I'd, I'd fix my truck so I could move to Los Angeles and all this. It was like, and the orchestra was practicing while I was polishing these knobs and uh, brass rails, and uh, they were playing, uh, they were practicing for their orchestra concert that was coming up. And as I was doing that, I just, I don't know, I was really depressed because I was sitting there doing this mindless labor, and here were these fine musicians playing this beautiful music, and that's what I wanted to do, but I could just feel I was light years away from where I wanted to be. So uh, one of the great things was when you brought video games live to Orlando, it was kind of a full circle revenge sort of story, revenge against myself, if you will, that uh, I was actually the guy. It was my music being performed. And uh, anyway, it was, a, it was a good moment for me. So thanks again for that. Ultimately, when you write music, you want people to hear it. And so to have more people hear it, especially to hear it together, uh, it's, it's really the, uh, that's the dream we strive for. Um, you know, in college, if you're studying music, you think about that shining day when you're gonna have a concert, a concert, with a room full of people who's going to, uh, who are gonna hear this thing you've toiled over in your dark room. And, uh, and so to have a, a touring concert like this, I, I think it's completely unprecedented. I just, I can't, I don't know when in history, I mean, Wagner didn't even do this. He was always rooted to one spot, at least. A touring orchestral concert practically unheard of, but the fact that it has been all over the world, the people all over the world have heard it, they've responded, they've sought me out on the internet and, uh, and told me they liked it, especially the Brazilians seem to be very, very staunch God of War fans. I love the passionate letters I get from Brazil. Um, and Greece too, I know you haven't played there, but I get great letters from Greece, because they, they hear it all of a sudden, they realize that that's actually in Greek and it actually means something to the game. Uh, but, uh, but man, it's a total dream come true to have, uh, have your music actually listened to by people all over the world. Well, probably my first big love was Beethoven. You know, there's something about uh, just the logic of what he does and the bombast that just 
echoes through the centuries today for, uh, for all of us, I think, for a lot of us. So that was him, Stravinsky, just absolutely stuff, great stuff. That's like heavy metal uh, orchestra music. Some of the stuff he's done is just so interesting uh, and so just inventive. Uh, so those are probably the two biggest ones. Um, uh, guys who are living today, John Crilliano, I really love his stuff. And, uh, and you know, Joe Schwantner, Chris Rouse, those guys write some interesting stuff too. Um, but I gotta say too, I got into this, in the music in the first place, to be a rock star. So, 80s metal, you can still hear plenty of that in my music. I mean, you listen to God of War, there is 80s metal all through that thing, man. There is old school Metallica, there's maybe even some rad in there somewhere. <laughs> I studied uh, theory and composition, classical training at uh, Stetson University in Florida. And then I did the one year film scoring program at USC. And after getting out of there, uh, I've just been clawing my way up that uh, Hollywood food chain ever since. And uh, the biggest shot in the arm to, I think, to my career and so many other of my colleagues, like Christopher Leonard's, is the, is the video games industry taking off like it has, uh, the technology getting to the point where you didn't have to work for the company and program a little sound chip, uh, even though I will say some of the most inventive music was written for sound chip with those limitations, uh, but now the limitations are gone. You don't have to be a programmer. You can be a composer, uh, you can be a rock, a, I don't know, a, a singer, songwriter, acoustic guitarist. It can go into a game because of the technology getting to where it was. So. Uh, God bless video games for that. <laughs> Melody is, in my view, very important to uh, music. Uh, I guess it's not always appropriate for what you're doing in, uh, if, you're, if you're writing music to support drama, both in a, either TV or in a game. Um, it's not always important to, to have a melody to support drama, but for music to stick with you, for music to be memorable, it's got to have a melody in it. Uh, otherwise, I mean, that's what we walk down the street humming tunes. I mean, that's, that's what uh, resonates with our souls, I do believe. You know, I've tried to, st I've striven to write really interesting sounding music uh, in the past and with cool effects. And uh, it's, it's all neat and stylish, but the stuff that stays with you, the stuff that stays with me, the stuff I'm most proud of has a melody in it. That, that turns around and sticks with you. And it, also, it, in, in the case of supporting drama, like with the God of War scene, I feel like I did manage to write melodies that really stick to the game, that can only exist in this game. And, uh, and I don't know, that's, I, I feel more proud of being able to write a melody, one of the hardest things in the world, uh, than I do about making just big, cool sound and stuff. You know, melodic writing, very difficult.